All right, well, good morning, High Point. Hey, listen, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Will, and I serve as one of the elders and pastors here at the church, and I want to begin today by saying hello to all of our three campuses. I want to say hello to our Carville campus. How are we doing? It is good to see you. It's good to be with you here this morning. I also want to say hello to our East Memphis campus that is being streamed in right now. And uh, last but certainly not least, I want to say hello to our church at home campus. Regardless of whether you are tuning in uh, somewhere in the greater Memphis area or somewhere throughout the nation, we are so glad that you are with us this morning. Now, today we are in the second week of our series entitled Battle Ready. Battle Ready. And last week we began the series uh, by looking at spiritual warfare and the armor of God in general. And this week, what we're going to do is we are going to be looking at the first piece of armor, the first piece of equipment in particular. What we're going to see in this passage is that the Apostle Paul, he actually refers to six total pieces of equipment, six total pieces of armor. And uh, this morning, we are going to begin by looking at the first piece of armor, which is the belt of truth. Everybody say the belt of truth. The belt of truth. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And to do that, um, our passage uh, for this morning and for the entirety of this series comes to us from Ephesians chapter 6. We are going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 15. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. If you have your devices, go ahead and turn them on. And if you have neither, it'll be here on the screen below me if you're watching online and the screen behind me if you are in the room. So Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 15. I'm going to go ahead and read it now. And if you are with me, say amen. Here's what the word of the Lord says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore... Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. It's the word of the Lord. Let me pray for us. Father, we come before you this morning and we are grateful for the belt of truth. Lord, there are so many benefits and so many privileges that we get from our inheritance in the gospel. Uh, Lord, one of them being truth, uh, your word and your work. And so, Father, I pray right now that as I step into this message, I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart uh, would be honoring and glorifying to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God, I pray that from the moment I say amen, that only your truth would be heard, that there would be no deceit, no falsehood from my mouth, but that your truth would be elevated. Father, we thank you that you are uh, the very uh, definition of absolute truth. And so help us, Lord, to see you through the finished work of your son this morning. We ask it and we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So, uh, this morning what we're going to do is we are going to look at this passage. We are going to look at the belt of truth under two headings. We are going to begin today by looking at the need for truth. And then after we look at the need for truth, we are going to conclude by looking at the freedom of truth. So we're going to begin by looking at the need for it. And then we're going to conclude by looking at the freedom of it. We're going to begin today by looking at the need for truth. And to do that, I want to reread for you uh, verse 11 and verse 13. Paul writes, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And then in verse 13, he says, therefore, take up the whole 
armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Now, before we jump into the actual belt of truth, what I want to do is I want to quickly uh, define for you and unpack for you two very important terms that are going to be essential not just for this message, but for the entire series. There are two verbs, there are two commands that Paul makes in this passage that we have to understand if we are going to have a proper understanding of what he is telling us in this passage. The first phrase that I want to unpack for you is the phrase put on. In verse 11, Paul says, put on. On And then the second phrase that I want to look at is the phrase take up, which is in verse 13. So put on and take up. The first phrase is the phrase put on. Now, the thing about that word or that phrase put on is that it is written as an imperative. In other words, the apostle Paul is commanding us to put on the full armor of God. He's not suggesting it. He's not saying, hey, if you're you're not busy, maybe you should sometime, if, if you're able, put on the armor of God. No. He is commanding us, it's an imperative, to put on the full armor of God. And the word there is written in the middle voice. Why is that important? Well, the reason why that's important is because what it means is is that we are to do the action to ourselves. In other words, God is not going to put the armor on you. The world is not going to put the armor on you. The only person that can put the armor of God on you is you. That's what the middle voice there means. And the phrase there, put on, it it literally means to sink into or to submerge into something. It means to dress yourself with something. That's the first phrase that I think we need to understand, put on. But the second phrase that I think is equally as important is the phrase, take up. Take up. The, The phrase there, take up, is also an imperative. But it has a sense of urgency around it. And what it means is it literally means to carry something with you on the journey. To take something with you on the journey that you are about to take. It means to bring something along with you in order for you to use it in time of need. So what the phrase put on and what the phrase take up teach us is that Paul is saying we need to be every day very intentionally be putting on the full armor of God. What what Paul wants us to know is that this is not a passive event. No one is going to accidentally drift into putting on the armor of God. If you are not doing it on a daily basis, it's not happening. One of the things I said last week, but I'm going to repeat here, is that putting on the armor of God is the same as putting on Christ. In the book of Colossians, we looked at the idea of putting on Christ again and again, putting on the person of Christ. Putting on Christ and putting on the armor biblically are the exact same thing. Now, you may be asking, well, how do I put on the armor of God? Well, we're going to talk about that later on in the series, but let me quickly tell you here. According to Paul, the way we put on the armor of God on a daily basis is by praying it over ourselves every day. Like this morning, as I was driving in, I was praying the armor of God over me. I went piece by piece, and I prayed the armor of God over me. We should pray the armor of God over our children, over our spouse, over our leaders. That's how we put the armor of God on. Uh, Paul, at the end, tells us that we do it by praying it over ourselves. But what we see with the phrase put on and what we see with the phrase take up is that it takes very intentional, continuous effort. No one puts on the armor of God by accident. No one drifts into putting on the armor and putting on Christ. What, what one commentator said is that it's almost like the Apostle Paul is a military drill sergeant and he is walking us through a training regiment. He wants us to know all the equipment that we are going to need for battle. And he, is, he literally gives us an equipment checklist that we are to go to go through every single morning before we start our day. He is training us. He is equipping us. He is showing us what our equipment is so that every morning we walk through the checklist and we prepare ourselves for the battle that we are going to face. Paul wants you to be so trained. He wants you to be so equipped that when the enemy shows up, 
we are ready to fight. It's second nature to us because we have prepared ourselves for the fighting of the battle. He is a good commanding officer preparing his soldiers for war. So now that we have addressed the armor in general, what I want to do now is I want to look at the belt in particular. I want to give you the background for what the belt was for a Roman soldier. Now, here's what's interesting. What commentators say is that there's a good chance that as the Apostle Paul is penning this letter, there's a good chance that right next to him is a Roman soldier. Because what we are told is that Paul wrote this letter while he was imprisoned. And so he's literally walking through the armor of God, and he has a soldier sitting right next to him. He's looking at each piece of armor, and then he takes each piece of armor and connects it and corresponds it to a truth that we have in the gospel. So the first piece of equipment that the Apostle Paul refers to and addresses is the belt of truth. And what I have here is a picture of a Roman soldier. This is the picture that we are going to be uh, working through in this series. But what you see here in this picture is that this belt doesn't look like the belts that we use, right? I don't know if you've ever worn a belt like that. If you have, well, congrats to you. You're kind of weird. But, um, but it's not the type of belt that we think. See, it's, it, he wasn't wearing that belt to hold up his pants the way we wear belts today. But here is what a Roman soldier's belt was. It was made of metal and of leather. It was a combination of metal and of leather. It was used to protect your private parts, and that's all I'll say about that, but, but what, it was made of leather and of metal, and what it was, it was used for two very important things. Let me kind of give you some context. One of the things that a Roman soldier would wear is he would wear a very long tunic. It looked like a very long dress. Essentially, it was a, a, a burlap bag with two holes in it for your arms, and you would wear it underneath your armor. Now, the thing about this tunic is that this tunic was very long. It would actually go down past your knees and close to your ankles. And you would walk around in essentially a tunic all day if you were a Roman soldier. Part of the reason why they wore a long tunic was because Roman soldiers had to serve all year round. And so when it got cold, what that tunic would do is it would help keep you warm, right? But one of the things about this tunic is that because it was so long, whenever it was time to fight... It was very difficult for you to fight if your tunic was all the way down to your ankles. So what you would do when it was time to fight is the first piece of equipment that you would put on would be the belt. You would put the belt on, you would tie your tunic, and you would tuck your tunic into your belt. When you did that, it would represent that you were ready to fight, that you were ready for war. You, it would be hand-to-hand -hand combat, and so the last thing you would want is a long dress getting in your way. And so you would tuck it into your belt, and that would represent that you were prepared for battle. That's how this belt worked. It kept, it kept your tunic from hindering you or putting you in danger. Now, in Scripture, in the Old and in the New Testament, we see this phrase. There's a phrase that, we use, that is used often throughout Scripture is the phrase, gird your loins. We don't use that phrase anymore. But, but essentially, it was that. It was taking your tunic and tucking it in your belt. As a matter of fact, if you go back to Exodus chapter 12, uh, right before the Israelites celebrate the Passover, God instructs them. He says, make sure that you gird your loins and you are ready to go because once I deliver you, you're leaving fast. You're not sticking around here. And so he tells them to prepare themselves and to gird their loins. In Luke chapter 12, we see Jesus, he's using a parable uh, to describe for us that one day he's going to show up, and he's going to show up suddenly, and no one's going to expect him. And he says that people who believe in him will be ready in the first hour of the night, the second hour of the night, and the third hour of the night. And the image, the, the word, the phrase that he uses is that they will gird their loins and be prepared for when he arrives. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says that we are to gird the loins of our minds and to focus on the hope of the gospel. So Peter here is using similar language 
Peter there is using similar language to Paul here, and he tells us about, he, ta- he calls us to gird the loins of our minds. So what we see all throughout the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, is that in Scripture, that idea of girding your loins represented you being prepared, you being ready. So what we see here is that the first thing that the belt was used for was to gird your loins. But the second thing that the belt was used for is that the belt was used to hold your sword. Okay, when you walked around, you didn't have your sword in your hand all the time. You would actually put the sword in your belt. So similar to a police officer today or a construction worker today, the belt was used to carry your equipment. It wasn't just for show. It wasn't just to protect you. It wasn't just to gird your loins, but it was to hold the equipment that you would need in battle. But that's why the the belt was the first piece of equipment that a person would have to wear. Because if you didn't put the belt on, you wouldn't then tuck the tunic in and you wouldn't be able to put anything else on. The belt was always the first piece of equipment that a Roman soldier would wear. In other words, if you ever saw a Roman soldier who wasn't wearing a belt and had his tunic tucked out, you would know that there was no danger because the first sign of danger, they would put on their belt, tuck in their tunic, and fasten their weapons. So, now that we've seen why the belt was the first piece of of equipment that a soldier would wear, the question that I want to ask and answer is this. Why is truth the first attribute, the first reality that Paul says we must put on? Why does Paul use truth? He could have talked about the belt of faith, uh, the belt of righteousness. Why is truth the first thing that Paul says a believer must put on? On. Well, the word here in the passage, truth, here's what it means. It means facts that correspond to reality. Facts that correspond to reality. The word truth here refers, refer, refers to firm, unchanging, objective, eternal truth. So when he says truth, that's what he's making ref, reference to. Eternal truths that do not change. Facts that correspond with and to reality. It literally, in, the op- in Greek, is the opposite of two words, deceit and falsehood. Paul says that we are to put on truth. That's how we are to do it. Now, the question is, what does the truth here refer to? Is Paul just talking about truth in general? Well, according to commentators, when Paul says truth, what he is referring to, he's referring to two things. He is referring to the word of God, the Bible, and he is referring to the work of God, the gospel. Let me go ahead and say that again, because this is very important for the rest of the sermon. When Paul refers to truth here, he is referring to two things. He is referring to the word of God, the Bible, and he is referring to the work of God, the gospel. That is what Paul is making reference to here when he talks about the truth. Now, in Scripture, we see the Word of God described as true again and again. In John chapter 17, we see Jesus say this. He says, sanctify them in the truth. And then he says, your word is truth. Then in 2 Timothy 2.15, we see the Word of God described as truth again. Uh, Paul is writing Timothy, and he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Then in Psalm 119, verse 160, the psalmist writes, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. So what we see is that the the, the word of God all throughout scripture is referred to as truth. So the first thing that Paul is referencing when he, he brings up truth is the word of God. But he is also referencing not just the word of God, but the work of God. He's not just referring to the written word of God. He's also referring to the finished work 
of God. Well, how do we know? Because in this letter, a lot of times when we jump into a series like that, like this, we can forget that this passage is part of a greater letter, a bigger letter. We are all the way in chapter 6 of Ephesians. And one of the things that we see in chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Ephesians is Paul goes out of his way to explain for us and unpack for us the truths of the gospel. He tells us truths that are now true of us because of the finished work of Jesus. So in chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians, Paul tells us that in Christ we are accepted. In Christ we are redeemed. In Christ we are adopted. In Christ we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Those are gospel truths that Paul has just spent three chapters unpacking for you and for me. And so when Paul brings up the belt of truth, he's not just talking about the word of God, But he's talking about the work of God, not just the written word, but also the finished work. So now that we understand what Paul means by truth, I want to go back to the original question that I asked a little bit earlier. Why is truth the first thing that Paul says we must put on as believers? The reason why truth is the first thing that we must put on as believers, the reason why truth is the first line of defense is because deception is Satan's first method of attack. Let me go ahead and say this again. The reason why truth is our first line of defense is because for Satan, deception is his first method of attack. So our first piece of equipment corresponds to his first method of attack. Well, how do we know that? Well, in scripture, Satan is described by many titles, but two of the titles have to do directly with his propensity to deceive. He's referred to as the devil or diabolos, and that word actually means the deceiver. Then in John chapter 8, which is a passage we're going to look at later, Jesus describes Satan as the father of lies. So in scripture, he's referred to as the deceiver and as the father of lies. So Satan doesn't have that many titles, but two of them have to do with his desire to deceive the people of God. Listen, ever since the beginning, ever since the book of Genesis, Satan has actively been trying to do two things. He's been actively trying to pervert the word of God and oppose the work of God. Remember what I said truth meant. When Paul brings up truth here, he is talking to us about the word of God and the work of God. Ever since Genesis chapter 3, Satan has been trying to pervert the word and to oppose the work. That's what happens in Genesis 3. He, he shows up, and that's what he does. He perverts the word of God by saying, did God really say? And he tries to oppose the work of God in Adam and Eve, and he actually succeeds in doing just that. He shows up, and he attacks Adam and Eve. But, but what I want you to know about Satan is that even though he is the father of lies, even though he is deceptive, Satan is very subtle with his deceptions. He's rarely going to come to you with an outright lie. He's smarter than that. And one of the things that this passage says is that we must stand against the schemes of the devil. And the word there, schemes, in Greek has to do with something that is very planned and plotted out. In other words, Satan is not impulsive. Satan doesn't show his hand. We learn in Colossians uh, in the last series that when Satan approaches us, he comes to us with reasonable and plausible and believable Arguments. He, he doesn't tell you a full-blown lie. He gives you a half-truth. And a half-truth is a full lie. That's how he works. And I would argue that to this day, the same way that Satan tempted and deceived Eve is the same way that Satan seeks to tempt and deceive us. He, when he tells her, did God really say, he is using the same exact tactics today. He shows up and he says, did God really say blank? Did God really say that? Did God really say this? He is still using the same tactics. He wants to deceive you in order to mislead. 
lead you. Why? Because he is a deceiver and he is the father of lies. This, this is what Satan does. The, the, the first thing that Satan does is he tries, remember, my brother said, his, his desire is to pervert the word of God and to oppose the work of God. So let me show you how he does both. The first thing that he does is he tries to pervert the word of God. And he does that by trying to make you ignore the standards that God has given us in his word. He said, did God really say to give sacrificially? Did God really say to love your wife? Did God really say to renew your mind with his truth? And maybe you're, you're, you're dating someone right now. Did God really say that you can't be intimate with someone prior to marriage? Did he really say that? Like, is that really in the Bible? So one of the ways that Satan attacks us is he tries to attack God's standards, the word of God. Did God really say? Instead of living up to God's standards, he wants you to live up to your own standards. That's the first way. But the second way that Satan tries to deceive us and mislead us is that he tries to make us not just doubt God's standards, but to doubt God's work, his salvation. So here's what's so fascinating about Satan. He will make you sin. He won't make you sin, but he'll tempt you to sin by making you not live up to his standards, right? Once you don't live up to his standards, then he shows up and makes you doubt God's salvation, so he tries to keep you from living up to the word. When you fail to live up to the word, then he shows up and he keeps you from believing in the finished work. And then he'll say something like, are you sure that you're forgiven? Did God really say you're accepted? Did God really say you're adopted? Did God really approve you and justify you and redeem you? Are you sure that happened? That's how insidious he is. He makes you sin against the word of God, and then he tries to make you forget the work of God because he perverts the word and he opposes the work. He's been doing it ever since the beginning. Ever since Genesis 3, deception has infected the human race. What does Adam and Eve do after they sin against God? They hide. And from that moment on, they are no longer honest with themselves, with others, or with God. Like there are people here today who are still doing, including me, the same thing that Adam and Eve did in the garden. We hide, we blame, we deny. We're not honest with ourselves, we're not honest with others, and we are not honest with God. Deception has permeated every area of our lives. I'll give you an example of how deception has permeated our world and our culture. The other day, uh, we were sitting in, uh, at our dinner table, and we were having uh, our you know, our daily meal, we, we eat dinner together as a family. And one of the things that we like to do when we have dinner together is we do our highs and our lows. So we go around the table, right, and we have everybody share their highs and their lows. So the girls go, Lily goes, and then I go, right? And then one of the things that we do if we don't have much to talk about is we have this book of questions, and we'll pick a question for the night, and everyone has to answer said question. Well, that night, this is just a few days ago, the question that we got was, what type of characteristics would you want in a best friend? That was the question, right? So my oldest, Leah, she raises her hand. She's like, I'll go first. I'm like, all right, well, go ahead, honey. You go first. So she starts working through her list. She's like, I need someone who is very, very sweet. I'm like, okay, right? I need someone who's very, very kind. I need someone who's very, very faithful. Someone who is super courageous. And she just, she's working through this list, right? And the list just keeps getting longer and longer. And the longer the list goes, I'm thinking, girl, you need Jesus is what you need, okay? Because that person doesn't exist, okay? Like, you, you got to adjust your expectations. You want to talk about deception, right? Um, but she's going, and the, the, the bigger the list gets, 
the more unrealistic the person that she's looking for is. And the whole time she's talking, her little sister is across the table looking at her like, hmm, hmm, yeah. And once she gets to like the sixth or seventh characteristic, her little sister stops her. She goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that's definitely me. Yeah, that's definitely me. (laughs) And I looked over at her and I'm like, most of what she said is not true of you. And even on your good day, only about one-fourth of that list is true of you. But, but, but what it shows you, though, is she genuinely believed it. Like, she was convinced that that list was her. Like, I, I'm, I must be my sister's only best friend because she's only, only me and Jesus can meet those standards. See, but, but here's the thing. I would argue that even though it's funny when we see a five-year-old do it, right, I would argue that we deceive ourselves more than we think. And if we deceive ourselves then you better believe we're deceiving others. And if we're deceiving others, then we're trying to deceive God. Ever since Genesis 3, humanity has been in the business of denying, blame shifting, and hiding. That is what we've done. So in light of that, what I wanted to do this morning is I wanted to give you something that will hopefully help you in this journey. What I want with this series is not just to give you a bunch of theology, but I hopefully will give you truths and steps that will help you fight this battle that all of us fight ourselves in. And in light of everything that we've covered uh, up to this point, in in light of this need that we have for the belt of truth, I I wanted to give you uh, this resource uh, that I've worked on this week that will hopefully equip you as you try to live out the truth of God's word and the truth of God's work. So what you're going to see here on the screen uh, behind me or the screen in front of me if you're watching online is this thing that I've called, that I've created called the truth pyramid. Now, when I first came, uh, I did did some research this week and I came across these other pyramids, uh, these other things that are used for discernment or for wisdom. And none of them, I didn't really agree with the order that they had. So I'm like, you know what? I'll just create my own. And so this is a truth pyramid. And what I want to do is I want to walk you through this truth pyramid to show you how we should be evaluating the things in our life. The first thing right at the bottom of this truth pyramid is the word of God. Our number one priority, church, every single day, our primary source of truth and information should always be the word of God. Can I get an amen? Let me, let me level set with you here that this is, if, 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 if you're like, oh, Pastor Will, I haven't had a chance to date my wife. I haven't had a chance to spend time with my kids. Okay, okay. Are you spending time with God? The number one, the, the, the most important meeting of your day is not with your wife or your kids or your CEO But God, are you or are you not in the word of God? If you do that, everything else will take care of itself. But the word of God has to be your priority every single day. It has to be where you go first. You know, one of the things that that has really uh, bothered me about the American church today is that the American church, in many ways, they believe that the word of God is infallible. The American church believes that the word of God is inerrant. But you know one thing that the, the, the American church sadly doesn't really believe when you look at how they do church? They don't believe that the word of God is sufficient. And so what they do is they fill sermons up with, with 40 minutes of stories and pictures and, and illustrations. And then they give you two minutes of God's word. Heck, I've heard of some preachers who will literally start a sermon series and won't even look at the Bible in the first week of the series. That's a thing. We, we don't, it breaks my heart that we believe all these other things about Scripture, but we do not believe that the Word of God is sufficient. When we did our Colossians series, why did we do uh, 12 weeks, an hour each week? Because the Word of God is sufficient. I don't have to impress you with my, with, with my stories, and, and my, I don't have to. The Word of God, uh, uh, Spurgeon says, is a roaring lion. Just open the cage and let it do its work. The Word of God is sufficient. 
And I would argue that the reason why many Christians don't see the word of God as as sufficient is because there are churches where their pastor doesn't see the word of God as sufficient. And so why would I do it if they don't do it? So the first place where we should find truth is the word of God. The second place where we should find truth is the church of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. What, What do I mean by that? Well, what we see in Scripture is that God has given us the church in order to remind each other of the word of God and the work of God. When we come together, whether it's here in this room or maybe you have a group of people in your living room, when we come together and we hear the word of God together and we sing truths to God together and we do communion in the Lord's Supper together and we celebrate baptism together, God has given us these corporate reminders to remind us of what absolute truth actually is. That's why community is so important. We, we come together to encourage one another, to spur one another on in love and good deeds. So the second place where we should be getting truth, like I don't know about you, but I am way more likely to, be, to deceive myself when I'm not spending time with other believers. I'm way more likely to believe lies when I don't have someone actively speaking truth into my life, right? Now, the second or the third place that we should be getting truth from is not just the word of God, is not just the church of Jesus Christ, but it's also from Christian resources. Now, now what do I mean by Christian resources? Do I mean that you should only watch Christian movies? No, I'm not. I actually don't really like Christian movies, to be honest. I'm not saying that, okay? Nothing against it, just they just tend not to be that good. Um, which is sad. They should be better because it's for Jesus, but, but they're not. Um, but, but here's what I mean by Christian resources. I, I mean Christian books. Like, when's the last time you read a book by a Christian author? When's the last time you heard a podcast by a Christian? See, we, we, we have to be exposing ourselves. Maybe it's a blog that you follow that's by a Christian. Maybe it's a social media uh, person that you follow that's a Christian. But we need to be exposing ourselves to people who are pointing you back to the word and work of God. Then, last, this is a food pyramid. This is where the junk food is, okay? The last piece of it is secular resources. So again, I'm not saying we can't watch movies. I'm not saying we can't listen to radio. I'm not saying we can't watch certain channels. I'm not saying we can't watch certain people on YouTube. But what I'm saying is, is that that should be the last place that you go for information. I'm not saying you don't expose yourself to it, but for many of us, let's be honest, our, 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 our pyramid is reversed. Completely reversed. And if you look at your, your day, if you were to take a clock and measure how much time you spend in God's word versus how much time you spend on a certain news channel or a certain website or a certain Twitter feed, Right? Or a certain YouTube personality. When you look at the time you spend, your pyramid is reversed. But church, there's two reasons why we need to be very aware of this pyramid, which is why I wanted to make sure I took my time to explain it. The first reason is because we live in a culture that doesn't believe in absolute truth. We live in a culture that right now, not in 10 years from now, but right now is actively trying to redefine terms that God has already given us in Scripture. Things that have already been decided. Things that have already been said by God in Scripture. And we live in a culture that is trying to actively not just redefine things like gender and marriage, but redefine truth itself. And so the reason why we need to be in the Word of God, the reason why we need to be with the people of God is because if we don't do those things, over time, we're going to become more and more like the culture that we live in. That is what's going to happen. But, but here's the other reason. Another reason why we need this desperately, and I actually saw this during the politics series. One of the things that I said very clearly during the politics series, be like, hey, you might disagree with what I'm saying, and that's okay. But if you're going to reach out to me, you better have a Bible verse. Because unless what I said is unbiblical, I don't want to hear it. But you know what's so funny? 98% of the people that reached out, when they reached out, 
if they didn't have anything from the word of God, it was all from that top little triangle. Hey, Will, my, my YouTube personality says this. The blog that I read says this. The channel that I watch says this. Heck, I had someone quote to me the Hamilton play. All well and good, but it ain't in the Bible. So we need to get to a place, church, where our priority and our primary source of truth, our primary filter and lens is the word of God. Amen? So what we discover is that we are all in desperate need of truth. Not all truth is created equal. Right? You have logical truth. You have relational truth. You have biological truth. You have mathematical truth. You have political truth. But only biblical truth can renew your mind and make you more like Jesus. So, We've seen the need for truth, and I want to conclude this morning by looking at the freedom of truth, the freedom of truth. But before we address the freedom, what I want to do is I want to address the captivity and the bondage that the deception from the enemy has led us into. So I want to talk about the freedom here in a second, but before we do, I want to quickly address the captivity and the bondage that we as humans find ourselves in because of the lie that was told in the garden. What we've seen up to this point is that Satan likes to tell us several different types of lies. But I would argue in light of scripture that the greatest lie, the most dangerous lie, the ultimate lie that Satan has told you and me is the lie of self-sufficiency is the lie of self-exaltation. It's the lie of self-righteousness. There is no lie that Satan has told and that we have believed that has led to more captivity and more bondage than the lie of self-sufficiency, the lie of self-exaltation, and the lie of self-righteousness. Why? Because that is the lie that he tells Eve in the garden. Satan shows up to Eve, and what does he tell her? You can be like God. You really don't need God. That's the lie of self-sufficiency. That's the lie of self-exaltation. That is the lie of self-righteousness. But the question is this, why is that the most destructive and dangerous lie that Satan has told us? Why is that the lie that has led to the most captivity in bondage. Well, the reason is because if you think about it, if you and I are self-sufficient, then there's no reason to ever rely on Christ's sufficiency. If you and I are self-righteous, then there's no reason for us to ever rely on his righteousness. If you and I struggle with self-exaltation, then there's no reason for us to ever exalt him. And so the reason why this lie has been the most dangerous and destructive lie that has led to the most bondage and captivity is because if you are not the problem, then God cannot be your solution. If you are not the problem, God cannot be your solution. If it's all about what we do, then it's no longer about what he's done. That is a very dangerous place to be. If it's all about us, then it's our battle. It's our armor, and it's up to us to get victory. And a lot of believers, including the person who's speaking, we are like David in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, where it says that David was led and moved by Satan himself to count his army. Satan, uh, David starts counting, right? And it, it says that it's Satan who leads him and moves him in that way. And you might be thinking, well, what, what's wrong with counting your army? Well, David was counting the army uh, not to give glory to God, but to give glory to himself. It wasn't God's army. It was his army. It wasn't God's resources. It was his resources. A lot of us have bought into the lie of self-sufficiency. And like David, we are counting our blessings and our resources instead of the ones that have been given to us by Christ. 
The reason why this lie is the most dangerous lie, the reason why this lie leads to the most captivity and the most bondage is because, think about it, if the belt of truth is the first thing that goes on, if, you, if what you believe is not true in light of God's word and God's work, you're not going to put on the other armor. There's no need for me to put on the rest of the armor if it's up to me. That's why truth is the first one. Because everything else we're going to look at, the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith, everything else we're going to look at is a truth claim. But if we don't put on the first truth, we're not going to put on the rest of the truth. If it's up to me and it's my battle and my victory, then I don't need God's armor. That's why this is the first thing that Paul addresses. We have to put on the belt of truth. There is nothing that has led to more captivity or more bondage than the lie of religion, than the lie of self-sufficiency, than the lie of self-righteousness. How do I know that? Well, I'll tell you. It's not just because of Genesis 3. But in John chapter 8, we find a very interesting interaction between Jesus and the religious leaders. And in John chapter 8, you find a very well-known but misused verse that people in our culture love. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Man, our culture loves that verse. The problem is when you look at the context, you see that Jesus is actually exposing this lie that I'm talking to you about, this lie of self-sufficiency, this lie of self-exaltation, this lie of self-righteousness. In John 8, here's what it says. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, right? But then it says, they answered him. So what we discover is that the they includes the Jews that he's talking to, but it also includes the religious leaders because the religious leaders are going to be very prominent for the rest of this chapter. And I'm going to read, I don't have it up here, but here's what it says. They answered him. We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus says, truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. Then he says, verse 36, so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And then from there, Jesus says, what I am saying comes from my father, and what you are saying comes from your father. That's where he brings up the father of lies. So, so think about this context. This is very important. What Jesus is saying in this passage is that the truth, which is the word of God and the work of God, sets you free. From what? It sets you free from the lie of religion, from the lie of self-sufficiency. Isn't it so funny that the people who are arguing with Jesus are the religious people? The people who are arguing with Jesus are the people who think they can save themselves. The only people who are agreeing with Jesus are the pimps and the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the broken people because they know that they are not self-sufficient. But the people who are most arguing with Jesus, the people who are literally enslaved according to Jesus, the people who are from their father, which is Satan, the father of lies, are the religious people, are the righteous people are the people who think they can save themselves, are the people who think they can be their own saviors. Jesus says that is true bondage. That is true captivity. And the reason why you can't see the truth of the gospel is because you are too busy being blinded by the lie of religion. Jesus says, I came to set you free. And whoever the Son sets free will be free in deed. Here's the beautiful thing about the gospel, church. The gospel sets you free, not just one way, but in two ways, on two different layers. Because here's what Satan does. When Satan shows up, Satan tries to make you doubt. Satan tries to make you sin in two ways. The first thing that Satan does, the first way that he tries to mislead you is he tries to make you minimize your sin. He tells you, you are not that bad. But then the second way that he misleads you is he causes you to minimize your salvation. And he says, God is not that good. 
As long as you believe that you are not that bad and that God is not that good, you will be self-sufficient. You will try to save yourself. I'm not that bad, and God's not that good, and so I'll do it myself. But what's beautiful about the gospel is that the gospel exposes two very critical lies that we are tempted to believe. For the people who think they're not that bad, the gospel shows up and says, you are way worse than you ever thought. And for the people who think they're not that good, the gospel shows up and says, you are more loved than you ever imagined. At the same time, the gospel is brutally, is brutally honest about our sin, and yet at the very same time, it is incredibly hopeful about our salvation. Nothing is more honest about the problem than the gospel, and nothing is more hopeful about the solution than the gospel. It is brutally honest about our sin, and yet at the same time, it is incredibly hopeful about our salvation. So, from here on out, church, listen to me. When Satan shows up and tries to tell you you're a sinner, I don't want you to fight it. I want you to agree with it and be like, hey, man, it's worse than you think. It's way worse than you think. And when he shows up and tries to tell you that the salvation that you've been given isn't great, but you know, it's not great. It's better than great. I am way worse than you say, Satan. But praise be to God that the gospel is way better. That's what you do when Satan shows up to lie to you. And what I love about Jesus is that Jesus actually gives us the two phrases that we need in order to battle against these lies of the enemy. When, when, when Satan is perverting the word of God and he's tempting Jesus again and again, Jesus says, it is written. It is is written. So, so when Satan shows up and tries to make you doubt the word of God, you refer, you, you look at him and you say, it is written. But, but when Satan shows up and tries to make you doubt the work of God, Jesus gave us another phrase and it wasn't, it is written, but it is, it is finished church. It is finished. And so when he makes you doubt the word, you tell him it is written. When he makes you doubt the word, you tell him it is finished. Jesus didn't say it is possible now. He didn't say it is almost done. He didn't say, hey, I did a little bit, now you do the rest. No, Jesus Christ at the cross cried out, it is finished, church. It is finished. It is written, so the word is secure. It is finished, so the work is secure. Once we understand that, what we discover is that it's not about us. It's not our battle. It's not our war. It's not our victory. It's about him. It is his battle. It is his war. It is his victory. When you understand that, church, it sets you free. That's why in this passage, it's so interesting, we are called, and don't miss this, we are called not to fight, but we are called to stand. That's it. We, give, we have defensive armor. We are called to stand where we are, to hold your ground. Do not lose ground. Why? Because Jesus was on the offensive, so now we can be on the defensive. Back in Isaiah chapter 59, one of the things that we discover as we are told about the armor of God, this isn't the first time the armor of God is brought up. Back in Isaiah 59, we discover that the armor of God is brought up, and in that context, God is looking out at the world, and he sees the brokenness, and he sees the sinfulness, and he sees all that evil has done, and he looks around the earth and can't find one person to do anything about it. He can't find one person to intercede. And so what we are told in Isaiah 59 is that God puts on the armor in our place and he fights the war in our place. So what does that mean? Jesus Christ took the offensive and won the war. So now we can take the defensive and fight the battle. Come on, church. That's what we see. That we as Soldiers, the, the, the picture here is of a general that has taken a city and now he's moved on somewhere else and he's put his soldiers not to take the city but to defend the city. He's given us a generous territory. He's given us a generous inheritance. Our job is not to go take anything else but to stand. Satan can't take your inheritance objectively but he can take it away subjectively. Subjectively. 
Once you've been given your inheritance, Satan can't take that, but he can make you forget it. And that's what he tries to do again and again. Jesus Christ is the anti-Satan who comes to reverse the work of Satan. Satan showed up with deception and with lies. Jesus showed up in grace and in truth. Satan was puffed up in pride, and in pride, he tried to take the place of God. Jesus was emptied out in humility, and in humility, he took the place of man. In his lies, Satan brought death. In his truth, Jesus brought life. And now, as believers, we are called to put on the armor of God. We are called to put on the person of, of Jesus Christ. So how do we live in the freedom of this truth? We do it by daily reminding ourselves of gospel realities, by daily putting on the armor of God and the person of Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, the only way to combat the hellish lives of Satan is with the heavenly truths of our Savior. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, and we are so grateful for your word. And Father, I pray uh, that the enemy, if, if in any way he is deceiving people in this room, God, I pray that you would expose the lies, that you would expose the deception, and that because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the bad news is worse than we ever thought, but the good news is better than we ever imagined. Help us, Lord, to live in that reality and to experience the freedom that only biblical and gospel truth can bring. We ask it and we beg it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said.